right, well, let's open our Bibles to the second chapter of Luke, Luke chapter 2. We made it down to verse 20 uh, the last time we were together. We'll pick it up there tonight. Uh, tonight in our text, we're going to meet two individuals uh, whom the world has long since forgotten about, but, but two individuals who are uh, no doubt going to cast a very tall shadow throughout eternity, two people that were pivotal players in the, in, in the narrative we have uh, before us tonight, and, and they have much to reveal to you and I uh, concerning Christian living. Now, uh, thus far we have used the narrative of the first chapter and a half really to uh, bring forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. My prayer is that everything we do and teach here has at its center, as its foundation, of uh, the gospel What is the gospel? It is the good news that Jesus Christ, who lived the perfect sinless life, traded his wrath-absorbing life for yours and mine on that cross that God just took all the wrath of all the sin of all mankind for all time and just poured it out in fullness upon his son who absorbed it all. And and we have, don't know if you knew this, because of that, because he cleared the bar, kept the law, we are justified. We are legally saved. We are adopted sons and daughters by law that we are justified by Christ having kept the law. So we are legally saved. The whole point of this Old Testament law was to show man that he could not on his best day keep it. Someone was coming who could. That someone was Jesus Christ. Paul says, That law was our tutor, our schoolmaster, to point us to our need for our self, uh, for our Savior. So, so we don't sweat, we don't strive. Uh, Christ has done it all for us. Uh, He said it is finished. All of our past, present, and future sin wiped out in that one wrath-absorbing sacrifice for all time. We are now free to grow in our delight in Him, having been delivered now from the penalty of sin. Now, I'm going to keep taking you back to the gospel, because it has to move from here to here. Chad, let's see that first slide. What the Bible lays out for you, some of you have seen this before, but it's important that you get this, and I want to tell you this because I want you to know here that the gospel is not something that you move off of or away from. Because the same gospel that saves is the same gospel that sanctifies. It's the same gospel that causes you to grow. When you bow the knee to Christ, you are then saved at that very moment from the penalty of sin. This is the threefold deliverance from sin that the Bible lays out. Having been delivered from the penalty of sin, we are now being delivered from the power of sin or the influence of sin in our lives. And then one day, in heaven, in eternity, we will be free from even the presence of sin. Are you catching that? And this is why you don't move off of or away from the gospel. Because when you do, if you check the gospel off, well, this is just something that that I've done now, and now it's on to my little pet doctrines and all this stuff. People get, when they move off of the gospel, they're seduced into all this esoteric kind of goofy stuff. And, And then when that happens, this doesn't happen anymore. And you don't have victory over sin. You might get smart, but you're not going to get victory over sin. As long as we are here, as long as I have breath, I will continue to press into and pursue after a greater understanding of the gospel that not only saved us from the penalty of sin, but is also presently saving us from the influence of sin, from the power of sin that desires to rob you and I of human flourishing, that desires to rob you and I of that abundant life that Christ desires that we would walk in, not just here, but for all of eternity. Now, I know this is a whole lot of theology for an introduction, right? But stay with me. There's a light at the end of the tunnel, and it's not a train. Come on. All right. So, one day, you and I will stand before God and be judged. Only as believers, that judgment does not determine whether we are heaven-bound or hell-bound. That's been decided the day that you said yes to Christ. 
The judgment that remains for the believer is what your position in the eternal realm will be. Yes, you are heaven bound as a believer, but the position and the authority that you will have is dependent upon what you do with what it is that God has given you. Jesus has told us the resurrected, ascended Christ in Revelation 22 says, In that day I will come and I will have my reward with me and I will render according to each man. He tells us in the Gospels, right? Luke chapter 19, some of you will have authority over ten cities. Some of you will have authority over five. Some of you will be street sweepers in the new Jerusalem. But hey, you know what? Again, beats the lake of fire, right? Now, it's important that we understand, dial in here, it is the quality of our work that will be tested for reward, not the quantity, okay? Paul told the Corinthians this, speaking of the believer's judgment. Their work will be shown, speaking of the believer's judgment, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved even though as one only escaping through the, uh, the flame. So some of us will be like, whoa. Woo, pretty crispy critters on the other side of that uh, beam of seat judgment, right? But it is important for you to understand that there is no punishment coming your way because all of that has been absorbed by Christ on that cross. The only thing Paul is telling us is at stake is the loss of reward. Ten cities, five cities. There are way too many scriptures for me to lay out before you that speak of rewards in the kingdom, all right? It is interesting, is it not? Matthew chapter 7, that you got these religious brothers coming to Christ with quantity, right? Hey, we did this, and we did that, and, and we did the, the other thing over here, and we did all these things in your name, and Christ said, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. Is it not interesting that you can be caught up in iniquity while at the same time you're bringing forth spiritual quantity? God is interested in the heart. God is interested in why we are doing what we're doing. God is interested in quality not necessarily quantity. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Well, I hope to encourage you. Because you and I, we have a tendency to think that God judges you and I the same way our culture does. We have been judged, have we not, by and large upon our performance and, and you know, what kind of grades have you gotten and you know, what kind of sales are you generating? You know, the, company, the companies we work for are, are oftentimes completely satisfied with us either being proximate to or living in Jerkville as long as we are moving product and generating sales, right? God, well, not so much. He doesn't care about quantity. He cares about quality. And so even being saved now, the rewards that are in store for you and I, the position we will come into in the eternal realm, it is not based upon spiritual quantity, if you will. It does not matter how many religious hoops you jump through or how many grand things you do for the church if our hearts are not right with, if our hearts are not delighting in God. It is all about a simple life of faith predicated upon not what we're doing, but why we are doing what we are doing. You tracking? All right. Now, the two individuals that we will encounter in our story tonight, these were not people that were rolling in money. These were not people who had a long list of spiritual accomplishments. Okay, these were not movers and shakers in their day, but rather they were two individuals that lived with great simplicity and yet with great purpose pursuing what it is that God had given unto them and called them to do. 
Now, who were they? Uh, oh, and by the way, I have no doubt in my mind that when we see these two people again, even though their culture might have said they are nobodies, they are going to be numbered among the great ones of heaven. And if you and I will glean from the insights that God is communicating to you and I through this text, through these people, if we will learn from what the Word of God is presenting to us concerning these individuals, I have no doubt in my mind that we will be numbered among the great ones of God as well. Now, who were they? Let's get after it and go to work. Verse 21. And when eight days had passed before his circumcision, uh, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days for their purification, now, now watch how much the law is written all over this, right? And when the days for their purica, uh, purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Verse 23, as is written in the law, there it is again, of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. That's Exodus 13. Verse 24, here it is again. And to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, now notice the thrice repetition of the law there. All right? Verse 22, according to the law of Moses. Verse 23, as is written in the law of the Lord. Verse 24, according to what was said in the law. There is an emphasis upon keeping the law of God. Again, Christ came and kept the law for us. He kept it perfectly. There was no legal stone left unturned. There could never be a single indictment made against the life of Christ. He placed himself under the law, the Bible tells us, so that you and I wouldn't be under the burden of it, under the bondage of it. Understand, okay? Again, always turn that prism of the gospel and gain additional insight into it. That's what makes you grow, okay? Understand, I cannot save you. You cannot save me because we are sinners. We break the perfect law of God pretty much on an hourly basis, and those are just sins of commission. When, in fact, you consider sins of omission... Pretty easy to make the case, is it not? That we're in sin all the time. Hey, don't get bummed out. Christ took care of all of that for you. Do you understand that? Point is, because Christ is the only one to fulfill every letter of God's law, because he's the only one that's... I, I, I can't go to the cross for you. That'd be like trading garbage for garbage. He kept the law perfect. He traded his perfect life for my sinful one. All right? So because he was the only one who kept the whole law, we are legal adopted sons and daughters. You are legally saved. He kept every letter of God's law. He's the only one, therefore, that can go to the cross in your stead. That's why we see even from a young age, right out of the gate, we see the life of Christ coming under every possible Element of the law that, that it can so you would never have to. He did it all. Now, a couple of Old Testament observances being made here. You've got circumcision. We covered that in chapter 1 with John. I don't want to tear into that again, all right? Not my favorite subject. And then you've got the redemption of the firstborn child here. Uh, where, where after Mary's purification period of 40 days, uh, they would then, and for, the, for a, a baby girl it was half that time. But after those 40 days, they would take, think baby dedication today. They would take uh, baby Jesus to the temple uh, to have him dedicated unto the Lord. Now, uh, we're given some financial insight into the affairs of Mary and Joe here. All right, because notice when they redeemed their son, all of this is straight out, of, straight out of Leviticus 12, Bible students. But notice when they redeemed their son, their offering was two turtle doves or two pigeons. That was what you would offer when you could not afford a lamb. And, and these things were just pennies, all right? I mean, a beggar could afford them. Now, according to prosperity theology, I suppose Mary and Joe must have had a substandard walk with God, right? Because they were poor people. 
Uh, you know, the Bible knows nothing of that nonsense. Here's a shining example of it right here. Interestingly, also for you Bible students out there, this also lets us know that the wise men had yet not come to visit Christ, right? If you're into pursuing the harmony of the Gospels, we understand that Mary and Joe were greatly enriched by the wise men's visits. There was gold, right? I think we'd all be pretty uncomfortable with the assumption that Joe was holding out on God. So we're given a bit of insight into harmonizing the Gospels. Now, uh, more important than, than that piece, I suppose, back to verse 21. Notice they did, in fact, bring forth obedience. They didn't call him Joe Jr., but he was called Jesus. Again, Yehoshua in the Hebrew, Joshua in the English. Jesus in the Greek means salvation is of God. Literally, the Lord saves Now, when you and I hear the word saved, do we not tend to associate that with with something serious? You know, so-and-so was saved from a burning building, or so-and-so was saved from a sinking ship. If you discover yourself in a situation where you need to be saved, there is seriousness surrounding whatever circumstance it is that you need to be saved from. We understand that. And so we understand that sin is serious business. It is something we need to be saved from. Because if we are not saved from sin, it is going to destroy us, not just for 70 years or 700 or even 7,000, but sin will destroy us for all time, all of eternity. Well, we're not going to get into this a whole lot but uh, tonight, but the Bible uh, describes there, there being a place of outer darkness. The Bible says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth there. Now, now I can't exactly explain that to you, but it doesn't sound real good, all right? I'm pretty sure you don't want to go there. There is a place of outer darkness called so because there is an absolute elimination, an absolute absence of the light of God, all right? And that's what you're talking about, this light of God, the the common grace that we take so for granted here will be gone. It has been said by uh, many wise men that if, if you're going to hell, this is as good as it's ever going to be. And if you're going to heaven, this is as bad as it's ever going to be. But there is a, a degree of God's light, an utter absence of that in hell, in this outer darkness. And every soul that rejects the saving work of Christ is headed in that direction. And there's no party there. I don't care what ACDC tells you. Now, there is a highway to hell, all right? So uh, theologically, I suppose they're correct there, Matthew 7, 13, right? But there is no party going on in hell. It is something we desperately need to be saved from. So they named him Jesus, the Lord saves. Salvation is of God. Now, I, I'm going to give you a little visual here. Here's where Mary and Joe landed uh, here. Uh, a little over a month, again, after Christ was born, after the purification, we would now find them in the temple preparing to dedicate this baby. This is a shot of what is called the Court of Women. Uh, just outside this area, you can't see it to this side, are these massive outer courts, hundreds of thousands of square feet in the Court of Women, which would court them off from the temple. Uh, This was an area of about 40,000 square feet in the court of women. This is where our our Joe and Mary would be here. Our our, uh, protagonists in the story today are here. So here you would have Mary and Joe making their way through the outer courts into this court of women here. And this is as far as a woman could go. Because this court would cordon them off from the actual temple. And so what they would do is they would purchase their turtle doves and their pigeons. Off to the right here, there were 13 offering receptacles. You can't see them in this slide. Um, And there was a particular receptacle for this dedication service. So they're standing there in the temple, and and, and they've made their, uh, their... And it was on an honor system. You would make their offering. And then you would go halfway up the steps... And there you would wait for a priest to come and dedicate your child. So they're standing there in the temple. They're waiting for somebody to come along and dedicate their God. Enter Simeon upon the scene. Now this is the one, uh, one of the two individuals I told you we would meet tonight. Verse 25. Fascinating man. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. Now we're told three things about him. I want you to underline righteous and devout. 
And this man was, there was a name, uh, whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous, underline that, and devout, underline that, looking for the consolation of Israel. This is an Old Testament way of saying he's looking for the Messiah. And the, whole, and the third thing, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. So we're told three things about this guy. Number one, we're told he is a righteous Man, now, uh, you remember in the context of serving God, a couple of weeks ago, we kind of distinguished holiness in the scriptures from righteousness. You remember that holiness speaks of a man's vertical relationship with God. Righteousness speaks to a man's horizontal relationship with his brothers and sisters, all right? Are we tracking? So holiness is vertical, your relationship with God. Righteousness speaks to your relationship with your brothers and sisters, This Greek word for righteous, it means literally just, executed with justice. The idea is that that this is a man who treated people justly. This is a man who treated people the way they ought to be treated. Now, uh, we all know individuals, do we not? who are very toxic people. They're very dangerous in the sense that the the longer you expose yourself to them, uh, you know, the longer you expose yourself to their kind of toxic heat, sooner or later you're going to get burned, all right? They're going to hurt you in some fashion. It's like raising a lion cub, right? Super cute in the beginning, but it might end up eating you. There are people that are, that, that are that way. This man was not such a man. This is a man that you wanted in your life. This was a guy that because, listen, because he recognized the Imago Dei, right? The image of God. Because this man recognized that, that everyone that crossed his path was made in the image of God, he treated people with a kind of love and respect and, and dignity that, that should be afforded a human being made in the image of God. So just a, a wonderful man. Now, no doubt he was this way because of the second thing we're told about him. He was devout. So that was horizontal, he was righteous, he treated people the way they should be treated. Now we're told he's that way because he was devout. This word here means to devout, Uh, underline that if, if you haven't already. It means to reverence God continually. The idea is you're, you're holding on to this thing with a very tight grasp. You know, think skinny jeans on a worship pastor. I know like three of you would get that. But the other (laughs) point I'm making is that this guy had taken a whole... Now, our worship pastor doesn't have skinny jeans because he he doesn't roll like that. He's cool, right? But but this guy, just a super tight grip. That's what devout means. It means you're holding on to something. He had taken a hold of God. He had very deep faith. He was deeply committed to God. He reverenced and respected God. And Chad, you better not be looking for that picture that we took three years ago. We took a, we, Chad took my face and he emblazoned it upon the image of this hipster. It was pretty funny. So, uh, anyway, I saw him moving around back there. Oh, don't show that picture. Uh, if you're, yeah, we can cut, cut loose a little bit on Monday night, right? If you are a person that has a deep reverence for God, the fruit of that should be that you're going to treat people with love and dignity. If you're dealing with a person that doesn't respect God, it should not shock you when they don't respect you. If a person doesn't love and commit themselves to God, then you shouldn't be remarkably surprised to see their love and commitment and treatment of you less than what it is you'd like it to be. It's just reality. But this is a great guy. He's got a great relationship with God. He's, because of that, great relationship with other people. And all of that is because the third thing that we're told here, notice the Holy Spirit is upon him at the end of the verse. Okay? Let's notice the fruit of the Spirit here. Is he running around the temple, rolling around the floor? Is he barking like a moon, right? Barking like a dog, I mean, at the moon? Is he, is he bringing the crazy? Is he, is he scaring people with his devotion of God? No, he is not, and we'll discover that to be so. The very reason he is a righteous and devout man is because this man was filled with the Spirit of God, all right? 
The Spirit had taken up literally residence within this man. The Spirit of God was leading him. The Spirit of God was guiding him. The Spirit of God was speaking to him. Now, what did he tell him? Verse 26. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. Now, just like you saw the law, you're going to see the Spirit all over this. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Verse 27, more of the Spirit. And he came in the Spirit into the temple uh, when, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law. Then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. That word depart, very interesting Greek word, very telling of what death is for the believer. Underline that word depart. It means to release a prisoner. They would use it in that culture to set a ship off of sail, to untie it from the dock and to set it to ship at sea. They would use this word in that culture in the breaking down of a tent to be packed up and moved. You see, death is not to be feared for the Christian, but it is the beginning of something so much grander, and that's another Bible study. But I wanted you to see that. Now, you can't miss this, right? Notice how the text is just explicitly linking it. The text is just hitching Simeon's wagon to the Holy Spirit here. You can't miss the heavy emphasis. Again, back in verse 25, the Holy Spirit was upon him. Verse 26, it had been revealed to him by the Spirit. Verse 27, he came in the Spirit to the temple. You cannot separate Simeon from the Holy Spirit, and you cannot separate the Holy Spirit from Simeon. The Spirit of God and this man Simeon are inseparable linked, and that is precisely why this man was used of God for such a weighty purpose. Now, I, I do want you to notice the contrast. This man has no title. He has no position in the temple. The omission is beautifully deliberate here in the text. By design, all right? And you have to understand that at this point in time, the priesthood had been overrun with bozos. Okay, the guys with the position and the power and the titles were bozos. So what does God do here? He brings a man with no title and no position. The only thing he tells us about this man is that he was devoted and he loved people. There's a message there. And so what does God do since there's a bunch of bozos in the priesthood? But he raises up a man on his own authority to dedicate his son. God wanted a man like unto David, a man after his own heart. And he found one in this man. Listen, what is that telling you and I? That we don't need to be of any worldly status. We don't need to be respected of the world. We don't have to have some kind of a title or a, or a parking space or a placard on our desk in order to have a deep, powerful walk with the Lord, a, a wonderful, powerful relationship with God. Imagine what an honor it must have been for this guy to be singled out and, and chosen of God to, to dedicate his own son. I mean, for this, a man like this devoted for so many years. Now, tradition says he was 113 years. We got to take that with a grain of salt because tradition is just that tradition. But for this old man to serve God over the course of such a lengthy period of time, understand this is a stunning hour for the man. This is a supreme hour. So much so, he's saying, look, I'm ready to check out. This is what I have been brought to. This man is not afraid of death. Imagine the sense of fulfillment that had come to his heart. Huge hour for the man. But, but think about how easy it would have been now for this old, I mean, he's an old man, right? One morning his whole life is waiting for him, but, but he's an old brother. They didn't have energy drinks and Starbucks back then. I mean, how easy would it have been for this old man to just fall asleep at the switch? Just wake up and miss all what he was waiting for. Just year after year, this guy's showing up at the temple. Now, my guess is, and I'll tell you why, because of what we know, that he knew the prophecies of Daniel, 
that he knew exactly when the Christ, Christ was going to be on the scene because we do know in the narrative that this brother knows the word of God. He's going to quote Hosea. He's going to quote Isaiah here for you and I in just a moment. So no doubt also, as the narrative indicates here, this old man is walking in lockstep with the Spirit. The Spirit had no doubt illuminated the Scriptures. And God is, listen, just very naturally leading him. And here he is, just happens to show up at the temple at the very hour Mary and Joseph are standing there on those steps. Pretty darn awesome, is it not? I mean, what are the chances? Listen, I don't believe you can miss the will of God if you try. If you are leaning upon the Spirit of God to illuminate the Word of God. If you are relying upon the Spirit of God to illuminate the Word of God, I don't think you can miss the will of God if you try. I don't think you get all stressed out over the details. There are so many Christians that I've spoken to over the years. That they're almost panic-stricken over missing the will of God. Well, how do I know what God wants me to do? I mean, and how do I know if God wants me in Wyoming or Wisconsin? We'll start with W's. I mean, how do I know? I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I just don't think it's that complicated. You don't worry about the geography of the will of God. You don't worry so much on the where am I supposed to be, but rather who are you supposed to be wherever it is that you find yourself in this present hour. God knows what he is doing. God is behind the scenes. God is orchestrating. We just have to focus on our own character wherever it is that we are. Am I living consistent with the word of God? Am I treating people as they ought to be treated? Am I preferring elevating the needs of others? Am I being the kind of person that God wants me to be? And as you just live that life of simple faith, I believe you'll discover that God will get you from point A to point B in your life just as he had done here with Simeon. So here's a man of no reputation, and lo and behold, he's at the right place at the right time. Why? Because he's yielding to the Holy Spirit, just loving God and loving people, and it was in that place of simplicity that God got the man to where he needed to be. Now, can you and I say, and you answer this in the quietness of your own hearts this week, can you and I say with any degree of confidence that yes, I believe God's Spirit is upon my life. Yes, I believe that the Holy Spirit leads me. And I, I believe that the Holy Spirit speaks to me. And, and listen, I'm not saying that you understand that you hear voices. Understand that. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that when you hear the word of God, does it make sense to you? Are you beginning to get a hold of it? Are, are you beginning to understand it? Well, where do you suppose that understanding comes from? I'll save you the suspense. It comes from the Holy Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit lead and guide and speak to you? Illuminating the Word of God. All right? Now, beautiful object lesson in here. Powerful picture. Where has the Holy Spirit led this man? Verse 30. For my eyes have seen your salvation... Straight to Jesus Christ. Don't miss that. Which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. That's going to surprise Mary and Joe. And the glory of your people Israel and his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. Now, so, but back to verse 30. That's the key verse there. For my eyes have seen your salvation. I am looking at the salvation of God. By the way, what is he not looking at? A big old book of church rules, right? But he is looking at a month-old baby boy, and he is saying, I am staring at the salvation of God. Now, all the spiritual activity, right? The Holy Spirit has just been all over this man, Simeon. We're told three times upon him, leading him, guiding him, where? Directly to Jesus Christ. Are you seeing this? 
Are you tracking? Literally and figuratively, the Holy Spirit has led this man directly to the person of Jesus Christ. That is the picture. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Not to get goofy, not to get weird, not to impress friends and relatives with spiritual parlor tricks. All right, that's garbage from the pit of hell. It is Christless and reckless. The ministry of the Holy Spirit leads one directly to the person and works of Jesus Christ, and that's the picture in the text. There's a lot of funny business going on in the church today. Holy Spirit's ministry is largely uh, misunderstood. Jesus tells us in John chapter 16, the Holy Spirit has not come concerning himself. He has not come to testify of himself, but he has come to point to, teach of, glorify, elevate, magnify me. There are people, they want to make the Holy Spirit the author of their bizarre emotional behavior. Again, it is reckless, it is Christless, it is demonic. There, there was a movie that I, some of you were around here long enough, uh, that I warned you about called the Holy Ghost movie. Um, I, I'm so glad it never took off. Absolute exercise in lunacy was what it was. They, they essentially reduced the third person of the Trinity to, to spiritual parlor tricks, sidewalk parlor tricks. No hint whatsoever of, of any kind of understanding the gospel and, and confession and sin and repentance. Here is, here's a discernment hack for you, all right? Here's a discernment hack. If it does not, if, if you are viewing or witnessing a thing, if it does not point to, teach of, magnify, elevate the person and work of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit's not the author of it, all right? The Holy Spirit has come to convict the world of sin and to point you and I, and indeed this man here, directly to the person of Jesus Christ. Now Mark verse 33 there, Mary and Joe, they're blown away. Notice what he said there in verse 32, quoting the Old Testament in the light of Revelation to the Gentiles. I mean, Mary, Simeon has just elevated Mary and Joe's understanding of what this child was to be. I mean, they each had an angelic visitation. They each were under the impression, actually, Joe had three. They were each under the impression that, that their son is going to save uh, the Jews from, from their sin. And, and so they're standing now on these stairs. Uh, picture this. All of a sudden, this crazy old man comes up, grabs their son out of their arms. And, and I don't know about you, but, but having a baby, I'd, I'd be a little like, yo, dude, you're, you know, are, are you steady? Don't be dropping my baby. I'd have been paranoid about that. But here's this old man, grabs him, and grabs the baby, and now he's not just talking about Israel, he's talking about the entire world. He is going to be a light unto the entire non-Jewish world, to the Gentiles. So Mary and Joseph, this, they're looking at each other, what is he talking about? Because all of a sudden, the scope or the importance of their son has just been ratcheted way up. So everything's wonderful, everything's awesome, not so fast, verse 34. I love the sound of Bible pages turning. All right, and Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, uh, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel. So some will accept, some will reject, right? And for a sign to be opposed. Now, there are a lot of verses that have found their way onto Mother's Day cards. Verse 35, I'm thinking, is not going to be one of them. Uh, and a sword will pierce even your own soul. To the end that, that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Now, here's Simeon. He blesses them. I mean, everything's wonderful. Everything's cheery at this point. And then the old man stares down mom, and he says, A sword shall pierce your throat. Now, uh, your soul. Now, uh, the Greek here is describing what is called a Thracian javelin. Uh, this is the end of a Thracian javelin that dates back to the first century. This would be on the end of a very long, well, javelin. And it was considered one of the uh, most potent and powerful w weapons within the Roman arsenal at that point. Simeon is not playing around here. 
He is describing Mary, a, a sword, a, a powerful weapon is going to pierce your soul. The most powerful thing that the world can throw at you is going to pierce your soul. And that happened at the cross, didn't it? Had to be hard for Mary. Moms that have young sons, your sons think that they know more than you, right? What was it like for Mary to have a son that actually did know more than her? And then he grows up into adult life. He's misunderstood. He's lied about. He is labeled an enemy of the state. He's eventually beaten and nailed to the cross. Can you imagine Mary's heart watching her own flesh and blood be nailed unto that cross and lifted? I, I for one, cannot. But Simeon's prophecy will come to pass. Now, notice at that very moment, we got a problem here, don't we? Because Christ has to be under the law. And the law says for a thing to be authenticated, it must be under the witness of at least two or three witnesses. Right? Notice who just happens to show up at that very moment, finally this morning, verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phenuel, of the tribe of Asher. Mark that. She was advanced in years. And by the way, can we, let me just pause for a minute. I, I, just, I did this yesterday, and I want to do it today. I just want to, just a word of encouragement for or the elderly among us. God has never done with you. Do not fall for the lie that I am in the fourth quarter, I am in the winter, I am in the two-minute warning of my life. God cannot use me for any magnificent thing. That is a lie from the pit of hell. The two lead people in this story are very, very old. Both of them much older than anybody in this room today or yesterday. And yet this is their hour. I want to encourage you with that. She was advanced in years in the middle of verse 36 and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple serving night and day by building churches and establishing Sunday schools and, and passing out flyers. Oh, wait a minute. I, I, I'm old. I, I need glasses. Just a second. Yeah, that's not what it says. Serving night and day with fastings and prayers. At that very moment. So this is, man, this is God's divine orchestration. At that very moment, again, God has his perfect timing. God is going to get you to where you need to be if we just focus on being the right kind of people. At that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continue. And then what did she do? Continued to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Is that not interesting? That, you know, again, we, we think serving God is, is going on mission trips and building church buildings and teaching Sunday school. And, and all of that's true. But do you mean to tell me that you can actually serve God by prayer and fasting? That's what our text says here. In fact, I don't know if there is any more profitable way that you could serve God than by prayer because nothing is activated in the spiritual realm that is not first activated by prayer. By either the Father interceding at the right hand or by you and I, God delights in the asking. Notice what he tells us about this woman. She was married at one point. And she was married seven years before her husband died. Now, uh, they would get married at 14, 15, 16 years of age, far younger than what we're familiar with. So that meant when her husband died, she was in her early 20s somewhere, and then she remained single for 60 years. Now, there's a very good chance she was single by choice here. Listen to what one historian said about the women of Asher. The beauty of its women does distinguish the tribe of Asher, which was so excellent that even the old among them were fairer and stronger than the young girls of other tribes. And for this reason, kings chose the daughters of this tribe to be their wives. So evidently, the tribe of Asher produced some real babes. 
I mean, you've got some Barbies here. And so, so here you have a Barbie doll, 21, 22, 23 years of age. And attractive women don't usually stay on the market for over 60 years. All right, now, I know somebody, I told this to the church yesterday, somebody's going to send me an email on this one. All right, all right let, let me help you with that. There's the email. Can you see that okay? All right. Uh, so a quick, yeah, all right. But based upon where she wound up, it's probably not a real stretch to say that she stayed off the market by choice. Now, here's an interesting thing that happens to you and I. As you and I age, we can look over the course of our lives. We can look back and think, well, you know, I... I, I haven't really made my mark upon the world. You know, I, I, I haven't climbed any Mount Everest, so to speak. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not very valuable. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I haven't done anything all that great. And, and listen, man, I know what the enemy wants to think of you and, and the elements, that, the thoughts that he wants to engender into your mind. You and I need to be very, very careful on how we judge our lives. Some of you need to hear this. We need to be very careful on how we judge our lives and how we think about our past. Paul said to the church at Corinth, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the things of darkness and test the counsel of men's hearts. Each man will receive his praise from God. Do you understand that you and I are not equipped to be able to judge whether our lives have been a success or have been a failure? You do not know what God's going to do with your life in the future. You do not know what God... I am convinced... Well, of course... Now, we can assent to that. We, we know that we don't know what God's going to do with our future. But I am equally convinced that you don't know what God has done with your past. How many times might you have had a conversation with somebody? You have totally forgotten the conversation, and you said that one thing, and it just stuck with them. And, and they, were, they were ready to give up, man. They were ready to check out. And you said that one thing, and it just it ministered strength and encouragement to them. And it, it just kept them moving forward. You're not even aware of it. You don't know what God has done. You don't know the people that are watching you from a distance. You don't know the people that are watching the way you deal with your family and, and how you handle strife and, 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 and how you relate to God. You just don't know. Here is an 84-year-old woman who did nothing but pray and fast for six decades. And, and I'm sure that she could look back over the course of her life and wonder what it was all about. And yet, how did God use this woman? Well, made the dedication of his son legal. The law said, for a thing to be established, there must be two or three witnesses. And so here comes this lady out of nowhere. And understand, everybody knows who, knows who she is, right? I mean, you don't hang around the temple for 60 years. People don't know who you are. And so here's this old guy saying all this stuff to Mary and Joe. Some of it a little weird, all right? And maybe they're thinking, is this guy nuts? Is he bringing the dementia here? I mean, blow out on step four. And then all of a sudden, here comes this woman that everybody knows, and she comes, and she brings confirmation, satisfies the law, and just brings comfort and confirmation to the heart of, of Mary and Joseph. Awesome. Mark verse 38, by the way, what is she doing? She is just talking to anybody that will listen about Christ. She's not cramming the Bible down people's throats. She's not entering into these debates, right? She's just talking to people about Christ. Anybody that wants to hear about redemption, she's going to talk to them. So mark it there. The two things she's doing in verse 38, she's praising God and she's talking to people. The very same things that we discovered Simeon doing in his life. In Christ's day, and we'll land the plane here, 
In Christ's day, you had four religious groups and one faithful remnant. Okay, you had the, the Sadducees. You know, these guys were the Democrats. You know, they were the power people, and yet they didn't even believe in the resurrection, right? Then you had the Pharisees. I guess you could call them the Republicans uh, of the day, right? Pun intended. Um, super legalistic. You know, they thought their efforts made them right with God. And, and then you had the zealots, a third group, political nationalists. That, uh, their interests lied in the political overthrow of Rome. And then you had the Essenes. They didn't want anything to do with any of these political parties. They were the ascetics living out in the desert, Pretty good chance they raised John the Baptist. Those were your four main groups at the time. None of them dialed into the gospel at all. And then you had a very small group of people. And it's always been this way. There's always been the faithful remnant. It's always been a small group. Christ said that way is going to be narrow. And we act like we're surprised. You had this small group of people whose hearts were burning for Christ, Simeon and Anna among them. And this little band would only eventually muster up about 120 people there in the upper room at Pentecost. And yet, God takes that faithful remnant, and you discover this throughout the scriptures, this little band of believers were excited about God, and God would use them to change the world. It's why we're sitting here. Now today, I'm not sure it's all that different. You've got a lot of groups playing church. There are a lot of groups chasing signs and wonders. There's a lot of funny, charismatic business going on in the church today. You've got the seeker-sensitive movement that wants to teach not Christ, but Christian behavior. Very few believers, if any, come into a real degree of maturity in that environment. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you've got Reformed theology. And don't get me wrong, man, I love me some Reformed theology. All my heroes are in that camp. But within her four walls, there's a lot of stuffy kind of academic activity. And I I find myself wondering, where is the delight in God? Where is the joy made full? I wonder if the torch is dying out. And then you've got the faithful remnant. You've got a few bands of believers today, some large, some small, that are pursuing a living, breathing relationship with God by growing in their spirit-led understanding of the Word of God, that they might delight in Him and want to do His bidding, not have to, but want to. That is when he is most glorified in us, when we are most delighted in him. Do you get that? We'll get to that in a minute. And that is the vision I, I shared for our church yesterday. I said, guys, that, that's, I, we don't have a 10-year plan. We don't have a 20-year plan. You're never going to see a thermometer, and we'll never pass a basket. But I will tell you this. Our prayer is that we will be among that faithful remnant, among God's faithful seeking to simply be spirit-led, to have his word illuminated, and we've got to do that in community and grow. The body of Christ is a living organism, which means it must grow. Okay? In the ancient Greek games, it wasn't the runner who crossed the finish line first that won the race. Did you know that? It was the guy that got there in the least amount of time with his torch still burning. We got to guard against that man. And believe me, man, I know it happens to me every day. I just, oh Lord, man, just help me. Where are you going, John? Get back over here to, to what I if show. Oh Lord, I am sorry. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I just every day I have got to cry out that God might keep this torch burning, and by His grace. And his mercy, it, it, it still burns, and, and more than it ever has before. I'm still a flawed idiot, but man, my heart is aflame with the love of God. Let, let's guard against that this week, okay? Let's guard against your torch being ex- extinguished. Let's pursue 
uh, this week just a simple faith. And as we just pursue him and allow that pursuit to cause us to treat others well, I, I think you'll find that God will move you from point A to point B. I, I think you'll, you'll, as you just love him and love people, you're going to discover he's moving you in the direction that he has for you. Wait for it. For your delight. For your joy. Now somebody always says, and it's usually a reformed guy. I love to show my teeth when they do. Somebody always say, well, wait a minute. I thought, what is all this you talking about delight in God? And that it's all about delighting in the Lord. I, I, I thought it was about the glory of God. Listen, it's not about my joy. It's about the glory of God. Those are inseparable. God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. It is one thing to, uh, okay, yeah, I, I subscribe to that doctrine. Is God glorified in that? Sure. But is he most glorified in that? Uh-uh. Boy, you know what? I, I believe in that. And, and I, okay, I, I understand that doctrine. He is most glorified when you delight in the thing that you subscribe to. Not when you just subscribe to it, but when you learn to grow and delight in it. That is what attracts other people to him. Now, I'm not talking about you might be an introvert or an extrovert. I'm not talking about being fake, but just delighting that peace, that, that joy, whether it's a quiet joy or a stupid, loud joy like mine. Is there that joy God is most glorified in you when it is obvious that you are most satisfied in him? Nail that to the ground if you haven't already. He wants your joy to be full. Now, don't take my word for it. Don't ever listen to a word I say up here. Be a good Acts chapter 17 Berean and search these things out in the scriptures to see if what is taught is true. So, in the spirit of that, here's a novel idea. Let's just go to God and ask him. Straight from our context, loving God, loving people, straight to the context from John chapter 15. Abide in me, I'll abide in you. By this will they know your love for one another. Okay, same context. So let's just go to God and always get back to this. Your delight in him is what glorifies him. It'll keep your torch burning. It is as your joy is complete, made full. It is as you are delighting in him, that is when he is most glorified in you. So, so let's ask him from our context to the same context. Lord, I know I am saved. Thank you very much. That's wonderful and that's great. But here in my text, I mean, you know, if you've already saved me from blowing it, which I have and will continue to do, if you've already saved me from all of my blunders, why exactly is it that you're asking me to continue? You already saved me. Why are you asking me to continue to pursue you? Why are you asking me to treat people well? I mean, can you tell me the score? I'm already saved. And God says, well, now, yes, I can. These things, what things? Same context, abide in God, love God, love people. These things, why are you telling me? Well, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. That your joy may be made full. That your joy may be made full. Any questions? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, that time and time again when we go to your word, we see your truth, your passion for us. God, thank you that you pursue us. Thank you for the example of, of this man and this woman and, and the text that the only thing you told us about them, God, was they loved you, and because of that, they loved people. God, would you fill us with your spirit this week that, that you might inflame our torches again. Where they have died out, would you rekindle them? Where, where we have lost our will, would you cause our hearts to cry out to you to work in our hearts this week? God, would you help us to just enjoy you? God, we want to know you, that we might delight in you, that you might be glorified, and that we might make your son known. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said?
Amen. All right.